Okay, welcome to the second half of Introduction to Database. Let's all pretend we're starting a whole new course this week because that's almost what this is. Uh, the way the course is structured is at the break, it's split and we start fresh. Nothing, as far as I know, before the break is going to show up in any other content at the end of the term except for being able to read a database diagram. That is all that's carrying forward. Yes. No, the goal is the final test will be from today to like week 11. Like, yeah, that's it. There's only a final exam. That's it. That's a lot. That is the plan. We've seen how they flip flop, but that's been the plan so far. The first half you can just pretend never happened. Um, it's still affecting your grades, but it's, you know, that's as far as the pretending gets to go is, you know, you can just pretend it never happened. Um, the first half was important because it teaches you the structures that you're going to be playing with in the second half. It lays the foundation. Uh, the second half is significantly more mechanical. Um, if you know what I mean. Uh, essentially, you are going to be... Um, I hate using the word programming because SQL is not a programming language. But we'll say we're going to go with your programming. Uh, but it's not really programming. But we'll go with that word. Um, so I'm going to talk about SQL today. Essentially, if all goes well, you will have everything you need, or I should say 90% of what you need for the second assignment by the end of week, or week nine, by the end of week 11, you'll have everything you need for the second assignment. And after that, it's just knowledge expansion past that. Um, or you'll have almost everything you need. Um, today's a really important part of it. <laughs> so. Um, I just noticed, and I didn't notice before now, that this, this week's slideshow says week 11, because originally that's what the prof thought they were doing. Uh, and then I told her she was out to lunch, and she moved it, but she forgot to change the, the, the week number on the slides. It's week 9. It's group again. Just choose your partners carefully. And as you can see, the amount of bodies in this room has dropped dramatically. So there's a good chance that the you know, slightly less great partners are no longer with us. God, that sounds dark. Okay. And so also the other thing you'll notice during the rest of this um, term is there's two things. You'll see me typing code in a lot and you'll see how bad I type. I especially typing while standing, I'm really bad. Um, that's a, just a minor issue. I'm just warning you now. And two, um, literally I'm an SQL specialist. Um, database design, I'm very good at. SQL is literally my bread and butter. So, you know, if you ask me a question about SQL, odds are I probably know the answer. There's some quirks in my SQL that catch me every once in a while because I don't use SQL, my SQL on the regular basis if I can avoid it. It's, you know, not a particularly good database engine. It's just, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's like foot fungus. Uh, it's established itself and nobody can seem to get rid of it. So it is what it is. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, it's the structured query language, SQL. So SQL was developed by IBM in the 1970s. Originally, it was supposed to be called SQL. And for some unknown reason, that nomenclature lives today, even though it was never released commercially as a product. It's SQL. Just, you know, if you don't want to make, if you make me feel rage, just, you just fail. My daughter goes around, she knows it pisses me off, and she's taking SQL this term in her program. And she goes around the house, she'll stick her head around the corner. 
while I'm working, she goes, sequel. And then she runs away. Because <laughs> she knows it pisses me off so much. SQL is an initialism. Just like you say IBM. It's not IBM. All right. So it's been around since the 70s. There are standards. So when we talk about newer versions, it's not that it's a new version like Windows 11, Windows 10. It's there's newer standards that come out every so many years that add features. Features. Um, most database engines implement minimum SQL 99. In other words, the 1999 edition of SQL, which is probably older than a portion of you in this room. Why 99? Because it does literally 99% of what most people need. So it's kind of funny, you know, the 99 did 99%. Uh, 2008, 2011, 2016 brought in stuff like XML parsing, JSON parsing, you know, windowing, stuff like that. And not every database server implements all the features of each version. They cherry pick what they want to support because limitations of the underlying architecture may limit what they can provide. And um, some database engines like MySQL just so happens to not even support all the features of 99. It's actually missing some features from like 86. Just putting it out there that it does a lot of things and it's missing some features that everybody else has had for 20 years. Don't ask me why. It's just, I'm guessing it's a limitation of the underlying architecture. Um, it's like trying to drop a jet engine into uh, you know, you know, Prius. It's not going to work. Yeah. So the textbook in the course tends to use SQL Server 2019 syntax. However, there's pages every once in a while for MySQL. Uh, we're going to be using MySQL for this because, well, that's what we're using. Now, SQL is not a fe full-featured programming language. Um, it's a sub-language for data. Essentially, its purpose is, um, it's a single-purpose language. So here's where I usually try to make a differentiation between a general-purpose language and a special or specific-purpose language. Java is a general-purpose language. You can write a program in it and make it do more or less what you want it to do. Whether you're able to make it do what you want to do, well, that's a different story, but theoretically, Java can do almost anything. Obviously, you can write games in it, see Minecraft. You can write applications in it, see all the shitty Java applications in the world. SQL, on the other hand, is what they call a single purpose language. It's, it has one job and only one job, and that is talking to database engines. And it does that job really, really well for how strangely designed it is. Um, it's ubiquitous. Basically, anything that uses data, the enterprise grade database products has SQL in it. Heck, they make a version of uh, an SQL engine that runs in about uh, 500K. Um, honestly, we could be using that for this course and it would be just fine. Um, actually, I think that engine has more features than MySQL does, but the, the, so basically from an engine that's designed for being embedded all the way out to Oracle, IBM DB2, the big boys that run on minis and mainframes and that kind of stuff. SQL programming, if you're going to be interacting at all with a database is a critical skill. Uh, I can almost guarantee out of everybody in this room, there might be three that won't touch SQL because they end up in a tech support job. If you're doing any kind of programming for any kind of enterprise government business, you will be interacting with a database. They might be using an abstraction layer, but there's still SQL happening somewhere between your code and the database. Um, and it's one of those things where I tend to give my call back to when I was in college and I thought to myself, I hate database. Hate it with a passion. I'll never work in it. First job, database. Second job, 4GL. So sort of like a database. Third job, database. Fourth job, database. Guess what I've been doing for the last 26, almost 27 years? Database. 
This coming from the guy who almost failed his Oracle administration course because he thought he wasn't ever going to work in database. I had to pick a course to sacrifice. That was the one I picked. I chose badly. Okay, so SQL is broken down into subsets. And we will be focusing on the first two of these. And we'll be talking sort of about one of the others. So there's a data definition language known as DDL. Uh, DDL is used to create the database and the structures. It has nothing to do with the data. DDL is the contractor that comes up and puts up the walls for your house. You define what the house should look like. You execute it. The database basically builds the rooms in your house, also known as tables. Uh, DML. That's the language used to actually manipulate the data, the data. Thus, it's data manipulation language. And it's used for queries, inserting, modifying, retrieving data, data records. In other words, it's what you, you do when you're decorating your house and you're turning your house into like a hoarder, hoarder haven. Um, SQL persistent stored modules is very specific. A lot of database engines don't have that. Um, Oracle has it, Microsoft SQL Server has it, MySQL does not. Um, they're basically um, special code that's embedded right in the database that can be executed. Transaction control language. Um, I always found it odd on this slide that they decided to separate TCL from DML because you can't use TCL without DML. So basically TCL is a subset of uh, DML. Um, transaction control language, we will actually talk about that I think in the very last lecture. And essentially it's the system used to make sure that things don't go badly in your database, which is why I'd never use MySQL for financials. Because even though it supports transactions, you have to do it in a very specific way. Otherwise the whole thing just doesn't actually do anything. Banks use transactions. It's to make sure that the data doesn't get corrupted. And then there's DCL, which is data control language. And that is what is used for securing the database. So giving access to people, removing access, determining who can do what to where and how. And the funny thing is, is that although DCL is universal, how it's implemented is not. So that's one of the reasons why we don't cover it in this course, because it tends to be very platform specific. The statements to give permissions for people is similar from one database engine to the other, but never quite the same. And the permissions you can give are never quite the same. And the behavior is never quite the same. So, you know, that's basically you learn it as you want, as you admin. Um, for those of you that have been, you know, browsing through my YouTube channel, if you want to learn about DCL, go take a look at the course code for 8250. There's about two weeks of DCL in that course. And I'm teaching it in January, so if you just want to wait till, I don't know, end of February, you'll get all the freshest version of it. So, you know. Okay, so I'm going to start out with the create table statement. So, so far you guys learned about, you know, using MySQL Workbench, you drop a table, you add some columns, define some data types. Congratulations. You did the graphical representation of the table. You didn't create the table. You made a picture that looks like a table. When you create the table structure, the command is basically create table. You give it a name. And then you define the columns and any constraints that are in there. And then you execute it. And there's a few examples in here, and then I'm actually going to demo it so you guys see it actually happen. Um, so when we talk about constraints, a few of the normal constraints that you will see, and by the way, you can either create the constraints as you create the table, or you can use something called alter table to add more constraints later. Because uh, anything you can create, you can also alter and drop. Um, so the common constraints you'll see is primary key, foreign key, 
null or not null. So remember in your diagramming tool, when you hit the little null, not null checkbox. Uh, unique, which you might not have seen. Um, unique means that any value that goes into that column must be unique. You can never enter duplicate values in that spot. It's a great one to have on email. Just saying, you don't want multiple emails, the same email in the system more than once. Uh, check, which I will gloss over. Uh, why? Because MySQL only implements about half of the check commands you will see. And half of the time it doesn't even use them anyways. So it is what it is. And then there's the last one called default. Technically default is not a constraint. It sets the default value for a given column. So you could set a, a date field to be default to the current date. So that when a record gets inserted and if that particular field is not supplied as part of the insert statement, it will grab today's date automatically. Um, often you'll do use this with Booleans to default to true or false. Yes. I'm getting there. All right, here's an example of a create table statement. And now I'm gonna answer your question while I'm got this on the screen. SQL technically is not case sensitive, the language itself. Attributes and table names may be case sensitive depending on what database engine you are using. So using capital letters like caps for this is a convention, not a requirement. One of the reasons why a lot of people like using capitals on, and ignore the word artist, which is why it irritates me that they use caps for table names. Um, the create table here is the SQL command. This is the table name. These are the attributes. There's your data types. And then you got your different constraints down the end. So technically you could write create table lowercase and it would work just fine. You can set the data types, null, not null, primary key, all that jazz. All cool, yeah. Well, no, the convention, there you use whatever works for you. I can read it either way. A lot of people prefer doing uppercase so they can differentiate visually from the SQL keywords and the non, like the database objects. And actually I just noticed there's a tiny little typo. There should be a space right there. Um, that might be me when I kind of try to fix these slides when they were broken, because they were really broken when I got them. Okay, so if we look over here, we got the artist ID, it's an integer, it set as not null, and you'll see this thing here called auto increment. Auto increment is MySQL specific. Anybody want to take a guess what auto increment does? Yeah, that's exactly what it does, it'll go, Every time you insert a record, it'll go, what's the next value available to me? One, two, three, four. It automatically sets the value for the primary key. We're harking back to our synthetic keys or our surrogate keys, depending which word you want to use. Remember a surrogate key, synthetic key is a key that is automatically generated by the database. In MySQL, it's done by creating the auto increment column. You can have one of those per table. So if you're gonna have auto increment, you can have one of those per table, not one per database, one per table. Um, then we've got a couple of not nulls. If anybody wants to guess what not null does, it means you must apply values. It is mandatory. Null means that we don't need to populate that at all. Um, date of birth being a numeric is absolutely stupid, but we'll leave it there for now because that's what they chose to use. Honestly, you should be using a date field. Um, they're doing the primary key here. And like I said, there should be a space here. And in, inside the parentheses is the list of columns that belong to the primary key. Um, I will show you guys the other version of it when I'm typing it in, because I prefer the other syntax myself, because uh, I rarely use multi-column primary keys. The only time you need to use this is when you have multi-column primary keys. Otherwise, the <clears throat> they will get defined, but they just seem to behave a little weird in MySQL. Other database engines don't have a problem with it, but MySQL doesn't like it if you do multi-column 
primary key is using the other version that I'm going to show you guys in a few minutes. And the last one here is unique. And you can see inside the parentheses, there's two. So it's saying the combination of last name plus first name must always be unique. So you could have three Millers as long as the first name is different. A lot of people will find SQL easier to read than Java. Because it's plain English for the most part. Um, the only gutchas you got to watch is you got to remember your opening parentheses, follow with the matching parentheses at the end, and there's a comma at the end of every item in this list except the last one. There's no comma at the end of the last one. So 90% of the time when I have students going, my insert statements, my create table statements not working, one of two things is happening. They've got a comma here. Actually, it's a comma problem where either they've got a comma there or they're missing a comma somewhere here or they're missing their closing parentheses. Uh, and I guarantee that the error messages are not gonna be particularly useful. It tells you the line where things went wrong. It doesn't mean that's where it actually went wrong. It means something happened wrong before it. Well, you'll get to see that in a bit. It depends on your IDE. Some will, some won't, and if you're working at the command line, I guarantee it will not. Um, I was a big fan of trying to get you guys to do everything from the command line instead of using MySQL Workbench. People are like, ah, but it makes it harder for the students. I go, I know, but they're going to memorize it a lot better because, you know, Payne's a great teacher. All right, here's another example. A lot of this is pretty much the same. Uh, highlights we will see in here is the Varkar 1000. Um, over here is the default that sets out to a string, defaults to unknown provenance. Um, and the other thing you will see is this last constraint down here, which shows you how to create a foreign key. There is a short form of creating the foreign key. There is, which I will also show you guys in a minute. However, the big advantage of doing the long form foreign key is you can control um, what happens when the record modifies. So you can control the cascade behavior when you use the long form. Like I said, I'll show you guys the short form in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, this is just pure syntax. Like there is no, it doesn't get any more complicated than this. This is actually an example has pretty much everything in it. This this one has everything in it that you need. Um, so actually, it's a good time for me to pop out to start doing an example. All right, so right now I'm working with an empty database in MySQL Workbench. Um, and And here's your answer that no, it does not autocomplete your columns for you. Now, one of the big advantages of using MySQL Workbench is they finally added error tracking. You know, the good old squiggly red underlines you guys are probably used to seeing in Eclipse. Um, we sort of got that now, which I think about uh, two years ago in MySQL Workbench, we didn't have this feature. Modern. Okay. When you are in MySQL, you just connect to your local connection. I happen to be working with an empty database, which I will show you guys how to do in a bit. Or I could show you guys right now because it'd probably be faster. That's it. That's how you create a database. And you run it with the lightning bolt. And for those of you that want to know whether where it is, if I hit refresh on the left, you'll suddenly see that here's example two. 
And then if I want to use the command line to determine which is my default database, I can use the use command. And suddenly you'll notice on the left that it went bold. That's it. I created a database. Uh, if I don't want to have have this database anymore, drop database. I haven't even talked about drop yet, but that's how you get rid of a database. There's your answer. What's really stupid is it doesn't catch the create, but it catches the drop. Why? I have no idea. Um, it is what it is. So back to my create table. So here's my first line. It's ID, int, it's not null, auto increment, and this is the short form of that primary key constraint. So if you go back to the slides, re really quick, no. There, no, let's go back. Right here where we got the primary key, the long version. So this right here, that's the long version of creating a primary key constraint. This is the shortcut. Both are acceptable as far as I'm concerned, because you know what? They both do the exact same thing. The only difference is, is I don't get to give it my own name. If you look at the slide again, you'll notice right here that I can give it a name. When I do it that way, the database chooses the name for me. If you're working in an environment where there's very strict naming conventions of how things are supposed to be named, you do it the long way. If you work in an environment where people don't care what the primary key is actually called in a place where you can't do anything with it, that works. It's just going to create a primary call that, and it's going to be named something. Um, now, you will notice that I used a field called name, and it highlighted it blue um, because MySQL Workbench is amazing, and it thinks the word name is a reserved keyword. It's not. But it likes to think it is. So it's been like this for the last 10 years, and I don't think they're planning to change it anytime soon. Technically, the word name is a reserved keyword in SQL. It's just that nobody actually uses it. So it's been reserved for future use. And I'm going to put in uh, date of birth as a date. Defaults. Does it support this format? No. Oh, I always get this wrong. Uh, that. The other phrasing was a different database engine. That's why I always go for it. And then I realized that MySQL doesn't support it. Okay. So I created a table called table one. There's three fields. You can see some of the defaults. Uh, you notice I didn't specify null or not null. If you don't specify null or not null, it's nullable by default. So unless you want something to be not null, you can just ignore null, not null as constraints. And go. Really? Okay, we're not going to give it a default. So we created a table. I remember this last term where I fought with this too, about the default format for the darn date. Um, MySQL is really weird about how you handle dates. Um, specifically, you have to do something somewhere to make it behave. Okay, so now I'm going to create another table. Yep, you could, and then you give yourself a database to play with. Okay, so you will notice that the field names, two of the field names are the same because the field names are unique to the table, not unique to the database. The database, the table name is unique. The field name is unique to the table. It's a bit like, <laughs> you know, in Java where you got your variables, 
And if you have a variable outside of a method and you have a, you know, a variable in one method doesn't exist in this, you could have the same variable name in another method, but they don't actually interact with each other. It's the same idea. Um, it's basically, you know, the properties of a, of a class. Two classes can have the same properties because they belong to two different classes. Same idea. This has the short form of the foreign key. So table ID one INT references table one ID. That's the short form of this. This big fat chunk here can, can be summarized as this. What this will do is it'll literally do all of this and these two last options is defaults to whatever you've got as the default behavior for the database. So that's something that's configured by the database admin. You may not know what that default behavior is. Most likely, it's going to be a no action, as in nothing happens. And I'm going to run this and hope I didn't make a mistake. That one worked also. So if I go refresh my view on the left, you'll see there's table two, table one. You can see it's primary key index, it has a primary key, and, oh wait, is it gonna be on this one? Nope, I love MySQL, wait a second. No, I love it, I love MySQL. The foreign key actually does exist. Um, and I lost my query window. There it is. The foreign key exists. It's just decided to not play nice because I didn't give it a name. It can't find it, but it actually exists. This is that whole, you know, use the long version versus the short version. Yes. Yes, sir. How do you write comments? Double dash. Just like Mario Kart. Um, in theory, um, you do have the star, the slash star, star slash, but not all database engines support it. Therefore, you are better off using the universal double dash. Um, this is the equivalent of this in Java, by the way. And as you can see, it really doesn't like that I just typed that in. So, because right now I'm telling it to divide, divide. Okay. Like that. All right. So that is creating tables. And uh, this slide is just telling you when to use null, not null. So when you look at the one to many relationships where something is optional versus required, that shows you about um, null, not null. And you can actually cause uh, also the one to one relationship where you can make things unique. And that's a great way to make your life hard for debugging. <laughs> um, but yeah, this just shows you when you should use null and not null. And we just have one last really complicated version of this. And FYI, all of these check constraints, um, I am 90% sure that basically none of these three bottom ones will work in MySQL. Just putting it out there. Um, but these are different kinds of check constraints. And as always, this is database server implementation specific. In other words, MySQL will do it differently than Postgres, will do it differently than SQL Server, which will do it differently than Oracle. Which is why I often recommend don't use check constraints. They're there, they exist. The problem is that it's gonna throw an error and then the programmer has to guess why it threw an error. So then he has to catch the error message parse the error message, put in a special handler in the error message because of a check constraint that's in the database. Meanwhile, 
in the form he could have done the checking before the person ever hit the submit button. This stuff really belongs in the UI. But, you know, some people really like implementing it in the database just to make life hard. Um, so this this check here is checking if the person's nationality. So there's um, this nationality field here. If it's in this list, fantastic. Uh, if it's not, it blows up. Uh, this one here is check and see, make sure that the person didn't die before they were born. Again, that's something that should be checked before the form ever gets submitted. How many of you have been on a website where you fill out a form, you hit submit, it goes, oh, this is wrong, and it gives you back the entire form empty, and you have to fill it all out again? If somebody had spent, you know, a couple of hours writing a little bit of nice JavaScript, you never would have left that page. As a person that also does front-end development, don't do this in the database, please. Because it can do it doesn't mean you should do it. But, you know, there's some people that insist that you implement it at the database level. Um, banks come to mind. Uh, why? Because some of their code is so archaic that they can't change it in the front end. Um, I know at least one of you in here has worked for a bank. And whenever you see them pull open the stupid little dumb terminal because their web-based interface can't handle uh, condition A, B, C, <clears throat> T, D, uh, is really bad for that. BMO was smart. They just gave up and then bothered to do web page for like 90% of what they do. Um, and down here it's saying, hey, if the date of birth looks like a number, same thing with the, you know, the death. So this means that somebody could be born 1900 to 2999. That's what that's trying to do. And honestly, it's a really stupid way to write that check. Because you've coded yourself in a corner and when the year 3000 comes around, you got to fix your database. God, I hope they're not using my skill in the year 3000. Okay, so that's creating the database. If you need to change the structure of something you've created, the command is called alter. And I am not going to go in details in alter. I will provide you guys a link to the reference manual. Why? Because the alter command is different for every object in the database. After the first two word, after the very first word, it starts changing depending on what you're trying to do. If you're altering a constraint, if you're altering a table, you're altering a column, the syntax is different. And different database servers will also do this slightly differently. But I will show you guys the basics of it. So alter table can add, remove, and change columns. You can add and remove constraints. You can use it to change data types. Um, <coughs> you can rename columns. And this is where I make a fool out of myself because I can never remember the MySQL version of the syntax and I have up having to look it up in front of the class for half this stuff. Um, but the basic version is Alter table, whatever it's called, you want to add a column, you literally go add, and you define the column just like you would have in the create table statement. You want to drop the column, you go drop column, give it a name, and it gets rid of the column. I will demonstrate that in a moment. Okay, so I'm going to go... Um, My skill doesn't like it when we add. Well, yeah, let's try it anyways. Uh, yeah. Email. And I'm going to run it. And if I refresh, you'll see that email now exists in my table. Congratulations to Dan. I added a column to my table. As you can start to see, SQL is very English. Normally, you can often read it almost as a sentence. I want to alter table, table 2. I'm going to add a column named email. It's a varkar 100 or 150. It's very 
English-like. Does anybody want to take a guess why it's so English-like? It's an interesting piece of history. It was originally designed to let managers write their own reports. You got to think back, right? Think about back in the 70s. Reports came out on a line printer. Managers would send out a request to IET saying, I need this report. The person would run the report, give them a stack of paper. Guy goes, this is wrong. Fix it. Another stack of paper, another stack of paper. If they could actually go in and create their own reports, life was good. That's why it is the way it is. Um, they severely overestimated the ability of managers <laughs> to be able to do this stuff. Um, if I want to go, um, oh, hang on. What the heck is the syntax of that? Here we go. This is where Dan's going to pull up Google. W3 schools. This is how stupid this is. Because the syntax is different than the engine I normally use. Oh, it's modify. The database engine I work with most of the time is called, it's alter column, not modify column. Modify allows me to change the data type. And now my email column is 250 characters long. Yay. Uh, I can drop the column. And now it's gone. If I refresh this, column called the email is gone. And that's not what I want. I want this. So those are the three big uses of the alter table command is to add a column, change the data type of the column, and to drop the column. You can also use the alter statement to rename a column. And again, this is where each database engine decides to do it a little bit differently. Um, essentially, the SQL standard for renaming a column came out that's saying database to, to be SQL, say, 86. I don't remember what the standard was. I think it was the SQL 81 or something. Said must be able to rename a column. That was the standard. So everybody did it their own little way. And then you can see, I'm SQL standard. No, it's just the standard is that it can actually let you rename a column. Um, if anybody want a ladybug? Oh, come on. Here we go. I don't need a ladybug crawling into my laptop. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Okay. So you can use alter table to add a constraint, to drop a constraint. As you can see, the syntax is fairly straightforward. Uh, you can use it to create check constraints. You can use it to create primary keys, foreign keys. Essentially, everything after the word constraint is the exact same syntax as it would be for when you create the table. It is what it is. Now, SQL makes it super easy to get rid of things. And this is not Windows and it's not Mac OS. It will not ask you, are you sure? Dropping a table in MySQL is like pouring gas and lighting a match. It's gone. It's actually a lot faster than even that. It's pretty much instantaneous. Um, literally what the database engine will do is we'll say, this table no longer exists. It's done. It runs, it happens so fast that most of the time you'll not even, you haven't even realized that it's run by the time it's done running. Like the UI will take longer to draw than to drop a table. Unless you're talking about a table with millions upon millions of rows in it. And even then, 
I mean, for those of you that have dealt with large files, does it take any longer to delete a 1K file than to delete a 10 gigabyte file? Think about it. Does it take any longer on Windows to delete it? No. Why? Because it just makes sense. This space is now available. It's just gone. The, po the pointer to it is gone. So, hey, look at this. We got the syntax for renaming a column just kind of tacked on at the end of that slide. Um, so drop table is really dangerous, but I will demonstrate drop table in a minute. And although most of you saw this, you also saw how fast dropping a database is. It's drop database, it's gone. Um, basically put the files actually get deleted off the disk. It's not that it just is no longer referenced. It literally no longer exists. And this is where I give you guys the number one warning about SQL. There is no undo. You, do you drop a table, it's gone. You can't say, oh shit. Control Z. No, it's gone, dude. It's gone forever. Unless you have a backup. As a person who has accidentally dropped a production table more than once, because I didn't realize it was connected to production, <laughs> uh, it was really early in my defense. Um, backups are really freaking important, <laughs> um, especially when you don't realize that you're working on production. So, why can't you undo? because a database engine has multiple people accessing it all the time. So what would happen, you delete something, it's gone for everybody, so does that mean everybody can undo your changes? It's just how it is. You know, it's a bit like, uh, have you guys opened up the command prompt yet in Computer Essentials? Yeah, you know when you delete a file from the command prompt? It doesn't go in your garbage bin, does it? Same thing. Because 90% to 99% of your interactions with the database server are not going to be through an SQL prompt. It'll be through an application that is running. The application doesn't know about undo. It just knows that it just deleted something. There are ways of doing soft deletes, which is not the same thing as deleting. Those are, that's just programming techniques. When you delete something or you drop something, it's gone. It's, it's in the shredder. No recovery. Um, it is what it is. And here's three versions of drop table. Yay. Um, yeah. And this one here is a little different because there's foreign keys involved. So you have to get rid of the foreign keys first before you can drop the table. Um, it's one of the few safeguards SQL has. In other words, you cannot drop a parent table unless you get rid of the references to the parents. So you have two choices. You can either do a complete family wipe out, nuke the parent, nuke the children, nuke the grandchildren, just wipe out the entire family from existence. That's option number one. Option number two is you tell each child you have no parents and then you kill the parent. You know, I mean, it sounds terrible, but that's literally what you're doing to the database is you're gonna go to the table going, sorry table, you have no parents. Meanwhile, they're being taken out behind the shed. Right, that, I bet you weren't expecting Quentin, Quentin Tarantino to show up to the lecture today. But that is literally what, when you delete tables that have references to it, that's what you have to do. So that, this is literally telling the children that they have no parents. So you're dropping the constraint and then you can drop the parent. And then we have truncate.
Truncate behaves differently on different database servers. It lives somewhere between DML and DDL. I say that because, um, like I said, depending on the database engine, that last bullet point that says it resets the surrogate key to the initial value does not always apply. In Oracle and Postgres, it does not reset it. Microsoft doesn't even know the concept of auto-incrementing columns because they use something called an identity and it self-manages, kind of. Um, so what Truncate does is it looks at, so normally in the database, what you have is you have the database, the table structure stored, and then next to it, you have the data. So you basically have like a header that says this is the structure of the table. And then you have the data below that header. Depending on the database engine, it could be two different files, it could be a single file, you know, each engine does it slightly differently. Microsoft SQL Server is just a bunch of binary files. You have no idea where anything is. It just does its thing. What Truncate does, it goes, hey, table, you contain no data. That's it. It just tells the table, you have no data. In MySQL, it does even better. It goes, table, you've never contained data. And that sounds like the same statement, but it's not because it also resets the auto increment to one automatically for you. So it literally tells the table, you have never, ever contained data. Um, and this statement right here uh, is a lie because some database engines allow you to cascade truncate. So you go uh, truncate whatever the table's called, and then you can go cascade, and it wipes out the entire family tree. Um, it's not ideal because usually at that point, that's not what you're trying to do and you should be doing targeted deletes instead. Uh, but truncate's really handy when you are testing data inserts or you are um, holding data temporarily as in you're reading log files to parse. So you put them in the table when you're done or just before you start, you truncate. Maybe you're importing data into the database to be modified by something else. And at the beginning of every import, you truncate that table to make sure you're not bringing the same stuff over and over and over again. Um, just truncate's really freaking dangerous. You just literally can say to the table, you have no data. How fast does truncate run? Uh, let's say you had a table that had 10 million rows and you ran a delete command, which I'll be talking about before the end of the class. That might take, you know, a few seconds to run. 10 million rows, it literally goes row one, delete, row two, delete, row three, delete. 10 million rows. In theory, if you interrupt it, you might not lose all the data. You have a chance to not lose everything if you realize you made a mistake. Truncate is like, it's gone. It's a bit like when you delete a file in Windows. It doesn't actually delete the file. It just tells to Windows, this space is now available. That's what Truncate does. It's just... See this disk space? It's all yours. Do with it as you will. So just be careful with Truncate. Uh, it's really handy during development. You rarely if ever run Truncate on a production environment. Uh, create index, I'm gonna skip today because we actually talk about it later in the term. Okay, so, so far, hang on. But that sounds amazing on the recording. Listen to me sucking on my coffee. So far, you've seen how to create a table, how to make changes to the table. So you added a column, delete a column, rename a column, change the data type. You've seen how to get rid of a table. So that is the majority of what you're going to do in, in DDL, is create, alter, and drop. With DML, on the other hand, is where you start putting things into the database. And there's three magic commands, insert, update, delete, and select. And you're going to see me from, from here on out using, I just want to check my time. Okay, good. 
I'm on time. You'll be seeing me use the select statement a few times through this to show you guys the fact that these insert, update, and delete commands are working. By the end of today, you will learn the most simplest select statement you've ever seen, because really we start select next week. But, you know, you should at least see it. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is insert. And some of you are going to go, well, why didn't they call it create instead of insert? Number one, I'm pretty sure that they had all the different pocket protectors sitting in different rooms and they weren't talking to each other while they were doing this. That's my first suspicion, where they, whoever was designing the SQL language originally, were not communicating with each other because they're so different. Each command is so different. I have no idea why there's so much differentiation. Uh, two, remember my statement about the managers? They wanted it so it made sense to them as in, I'm gonna insert a piece of paper in my file folder. Because you know when you take a piece of paper and you put it in your filing cabinet? Normally you put it in a file folder of some sort and you're inserting the piece of paper in the filing folder. That's why it's called insert. Or at least that's what my database prof told me 26 years ago, 27 years ago. I'm rolling with it. He was much closer to the creation of the SQL language than I was. It was created before I was born. You know, so it's been around for a while. So the syntax for the insert statement is insert into whatever table you list the column names. You have a keyword called values, and then you have the values being inserted. Now, this is important uh, to note. In this example, which was that artist table that we were dealing with originally, you got one, two, three, four, five columns. And again, one, two, three, four, five. These must line up. So the values must line up with the columns in the order listed. Otherwise, you're going to be inserting things in the wrong place. You might be inserting the wrong kind of data. That's item number one that you have to be aware of with insert. Item number two. The number of values must match the number of columns you've defined. You say, I'm going to insert into five columns, and you can give it four values. The SQL server will go, what? Because it no longer knows 100% fact what is supposed to go where. Did you forget the first column, column in the middle, or the last column? It doesn't know. The SQL language is very English-like. It's also very dumb. Not dumb in the sense of it's badly written. It's dumb in the sense that by default, it assumes something went wrong. That's its default behavior. It never guesses, or it should never guess, I should say. So that's item number one. So if we look at example number two, because this table has last name, first name, nationality, date of birth, and date deceased, you can theoretically, if you're going to insert into every single column in the table, you can skip this part and just list off the column the column values if you're going to insert into every column. Very uncommon. But that is something that you almost never see. Item number three is I just want to insert into some of the columns. So again, last name, first name, nationality, we're going to feed in three separate values. And I'm going to demonstrate that momentarily. Uh, bulk insert, you guys haven't learned about um, the select statement yet. So this, this is saying that you can populate one table with the values from another table. Um, I can count on my on the fingers of one hand how many times I've used this in the last 26 years of my career. And I have five, four fingers. I don't count my thumb as a finger. So the bulk insert is not something you use on a regular basis. Um, I've used it a few times when I was manipulating data for one database to another database. I never actually used it as part of my day-to-day -day job. Uh, but essentially, you can take the results of one query to populate a table. We're going to talk about queries later. That's why it's kind of a pointless statement at this point. Okay, insert. Uh, 
They don't have the zero centered on my numpad. That's what that was about. Okay, so you will notice something here. I don't have the column called ID included. When you look on the left, you can see IDs here. And if you remember, I got ID set up as an auto increment key. Therefore, you don't supply a value for the auto increment key because it'll take care of it for itself. So I'm going to hit run. And if we, you look right at the bottom, it shows one row affected. Congratulations. I have created data. Remember earlier I said I was going to show you guys the world's simplest select statement? There it is. Select everything from table one. We actually will go into detail about the select statement next week. But this is just so I can prove to you that, yes, I inserted data in this table. So I can go back to what I had, and I'm going to go, uh, Frank's going to get added in. And go, and I'm going to add uh, Jane in there because I can't just stick to anyone. Okay, now I did this on purpose because I know that December does not have 32 days. So you will notice that it says that there's an incorrect date value of 1981-1232 in the column date of birth. So this is one of the perks of using a um, date field because it actually checks some of the data for you to make sure you can't put something in it that's bad. Um, if I go, th fantastic. It's in. And here's my three rows that I have in here. Okay, so now I'm gonna go and go do an insert into table two. And I'm going to go run. So I inserted a row into my second table. And table ID 1 underscore ID, I've got it set up as a foreign key, theoretically. Assuming that MySQL actually created it properly when I created the table originally. Which I'm having some suspicions, maybe not, because it's not showing anything in the foreign key <laughs> via browser. Um, so what's happened here is if I go... You can see there it is. So if I try to insert five, it's letting me do it because it never actually created the foreign key properly, which is where we have the joy of MySQL. It created the table without the foreign key, even though I told it to create the foreign key. Why did it do that? It's MySQL. It really should have bombed out and said, no, you're not allowed to do this but it allowed me to do it. So when you're working with MySQL, you have to be careful. So I am going to try to add um, I was lazy. I didn't feel like typing. 
if I just use the UI to do it for me. So let's try that again. I'm going to grab an insert from one. It allowed it. I'm going to put her in a second time. Now I got an error. So this is where the foreign key constraints from when you were learning before the break, you know what I'm saying? This column is a foreign key for this table comes into effect. It's basically saying that in the column called table ID one, you may not insert any values that don't exist in table one. That's what I just created was a foreign key that says that. So when you guys are working on your assignment and you see that particular error message, which is really, really small and the people at the back can't read it, um, good job. Hang on, let me see if I can. There, I don't know if that's any more legible for you guys at the back, but uh, it's saying cannot add or update a child row foreign key constraint fails. And how do you get out of magnifier? Oh boy. Like that. So it's basically saying that you cannot um, add a record that references something that doesn't exist. So if I were to add Jeanette back in again and run it, that worked just fine. You'll notice I can in the name field, I can add the word, the name Jeanette multiple times. It doesn't care. Why does it not care? Is because that's not a unique field. You can put in the same value as many times as you want in a non-unique field. So now I've got a table with two rows of data that are properly enforced. Um, if I were to try to go, um, okay, I'm going to go update table one set name equal to And I'm going to be part of the work next week. So this is the update statement, uh, which is uh, this right here. Okay. So the update statement is used to change the data. So inserting, I've shown you guys, I added a row. I had multiple rows, I added child rows. Fantastic. The update statement, um, allows you to update the values. And the syntax is completely different from the insert statement. Go figure. Like I said, I'm pretty sure that every guy who was writing, every person that was writing a piece of the SQL languages were sitting in separate rooms, not talking to each other. Because every single one of them is a little bit different. It's amazing. Um, so here's how it works. You go update, you tell it what you're updating. So update customer in this example, you are gonna set a column equal to a value. And now if you're gonna be really safe, you're gonna include a where clause on here, which is filtering which ones are gonna get affected. Like I said, we're gonna talk about the where statement next week in more in significant detail, but that is you know how you'd update it. You can update multiple columns by just putting in a common delimited list of key value pairs. So key being the name of the field, equal to a value, comma, key equal to value, and away it goes, which is this right here. So I could go, we realized that he was actually born in 1970, like that, and we can update Bill. And to be to update both columns at once. Um, if I go select star from table one, no, oh, table one. Tiable. You can see bill change. So I can change bill to uh, for nineteen seventy eight. Grab the whole thing. Run it, and you can see that now Alice changed. Yes. Then I could just go, just get rid of that. 
born on the sixth. Yeah, it does make a difference as long as you you supply complete key value pairs. So I could turn this on and go name equals Bill, and that would work. Okay, this is one other thing where I'm going to make a, I'm going to point out. Notice what kind of quotation marks I'm using. Single quotes. MySQL allows you to use double quotes. None of the other database engines do. Use single quotes to make your life easier. Build muscle memory that will be compatible with everything you'll ever touch. Don't develop bad habits now. Because in uh, Postgres and Oracle, double quotes are used as identifiers to, to escape the name of objects. In Microsoft SQL Server and Sybase, it uses square brackets. MySQL, being, you know, the special child that it is. Uses backticks. Hang on, let me zoom into that so you guys can really enjoy the beauty that it is. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's under your escape key. It shares the tilde, which is also another key a lot of people don't use. It's next to the one, if you're still trying to find it. Uh, I don't know where it is on a Mac. I'm hoping it's the same spot. Mac users, please correct me. Uh, that is a pretty universal key. Um, and you get sometimes you get some laptops like mine that actually jam five different characters on the same key. Um, yeah, so that's the update statement. You can do a bulk update statement, which is an update statement without the where clause. It is super dangerous uh, because it will affect everything in the database. Uh, by def if you guys remember lab one, harken back to lab one when I had you guys change one specific settings in your preferences. Remember the one you had to scroll down past all the options and there's a checkbox that says, turn on safe updates, and I had you turn that off because I made sure you guys could shoot yourselves in the foot. I made sure you could actually hurt yourself because you can't learn without pain. Basically put, the My, uh, MySQL IDE will not let you do an update statement unless you are including at least one identifier in a where clause. It won't let you say, I want to update every row of the database. It just doesn't let you, unless you turn that off. Um, other IDEs are similar. They got similar behavior. It says, hey, by the way, you're trying to do this. You sure you want to do this? Um, yeah. This is not something you do on the regular unless you're in doing development work. I actually did literally some of these this morning where I had to add a new column to one of our customers' databases, but they wanted to default to the values of another column. So I literally did update customers, set last modified equal to modified. Last modified is supposed to keep track of when anything changes, when the other one's only when one piece changes. So as a rule of thumb, always include the where clause unless you have a really good reason to not. Um, in theory, you can also do a bulk update that affects multiple rows of data by including something in the where clause, which is the filtering clause that affects multiple rows. That's also considered a bulk update. Um, you know, it looks something like this. So this isn't really particularly a good example because there's only one row of data, but it will tell you how many rows are affected. If I take off my where clause and tell it to update the entire thing, you'll see down here that it updated two. Changed one, but it matched two because I'd already changed one before. Uh, some database engines will not give you that much detail. It'll just say, bro, good job. Literally, it's like, that's good. Thanks. Uh, if you're lucky, it tells you how many rows are affected. 
Not necessarily how many rows it matched. It's just this worked. Congratulations. Um, it is very uh, instant and visceral. That <laughs> is a good way to describe uh, the experience of learning SQL. And again, you guys haven't learned about subselects or any of that kind of stuff. So in theory, you can update the values from one table based on the values of another table. I am not touching this until much later. Um, delete. You can go delete from table two where ID is equal to one. That will delete a single row from table two where the ID is equal to one. Or you could do like I did once when I didn't have enough coffee, which was that. I thought I was deleting something else and it was supposed to say something like this and I forgot the last five characters and I ran that instead. I nuked an entire table on production. Um, this is something you won't ever get another prof tell you guys about how many times they've screwed up at their jobs. Um, I've done this and I will admit it was in the last four years. <laughs> How did I fix that? I was lucky I had a backup from the night before. <laughs> it's a table that didn't change very often. So the good news is I was adding a feature, but to do the feature, I had to nuke records in another table that allowed things to only ever happen once. Like we had like magic records. It says, this computer has done this once. It's not allowed to do it again. So I had to purge the second table so I could keep doing it over and over and over again. And I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. And I kept deleting the configuration instead of the locking mechanism. Um, again, I didn't have enough of this in my system. Um, so if I do delete from table two, the, the UI took longer to redraw than the actual action did. Um, as you can see, it took zero, zero milliseconds to happen. Uh, I'm going to re-put in some data in here. Back to my insert. There it is. Bang. Uh, one, run, two, run. Okay, now the reason I'm doing this is so I can show you guys uh, delete from table one. So I'm gonna try to nuke everything from table one and I'm getting an error message saying, hey, I'm not allowed to delete something in table one because there's still child records. The foreign key is stopping me from nuking the contents of table one. Cool. It's doing its job. Uh, that I don't think is in the slides. There's a magic keyword called cascade. Um, of course, it's not letting me because MySQL doesn't support cascade. God, I hate MySQL. Um, well, actually, it's good because my skill doesn't let you do this very dangerous thing. Um, cascade means delete the parent and also wipe out the kids while you're at it. Um, so if I want to delete from table one, I have to get rid of the children first. So I'm going to delete everything from table two. Oh, there you go. I just destroyed the entire family. Delete the child records. Delete the parent records. Now my tables are empty. There's nobody home anymore. Normally, you don't do delete from table without a where clause, uh, unless you're intending to delete the entire thing. And if you're going to delete the entire thing, you might as well use cascade. Or a truncate, I mean. Because you're going to delete the entire thing, you might as well just use truncate. Truncate runs a lot faster than delete. Um, what? Delete does not do, though, the difference between truncate and delete is truncate will not reset the surrogate keys, the, the synthetic keys, on servers that support that automatic reset. Um, and I am skipping merge. Why? Uh, I've never seen anybody ever use it. It's there for your example, but as you can see, look how freaking complicated the statement is. And it's something I can... Um, Guarantee you'll never use. Okay, 
So that's the end of that slideshow. The merge is there because whoever wrote these slides decided you guys needed to know that the word keyword merge existed. Uh, until I read these slides last term, I didn't even know merge existed. That just goes to show you how often you're going to use the word, the, the command merge. Um, it's not that, it's not a useful command, it's just something I never came across. I don't spend my days reading SQL specs, and I can almost guarantee that MySQL does not support merge. Um, merge is known as a, an operation called as an upsert. It's basically, it's an, ins, it's an update, and if it doesn't exist, it inserts it. That's what merge does. Okay, so what do you guys need to know for the rest of this term material-wise? We need to know, hang on, let me go to Brightspace. Okay, so you will see that Come on. Lab six and lab seven are now visible. Uh, I decided to just make those two available right now for those of you that decide to uh, be eager beavers and try to reach ahead. <clears throat> I don't know any eager beavers that try to do labs ahead of time. Um, so essentially lab six is I give you a database diagram. You're gonna create a bunch of creates table statements. Why is this important? It's because it's literally like the part one of assignment two. It This has pretty much every single command you're going to need for part one of assignment two in lab six. Yay. Uh, the other thing I have done, which I'm pretty sure I wasn't supposed to do, but it's too late now, um, is I've made uh, the hybrid quizzes visible, all the rest of the hybrid quizzes. I think. Oh, uh, no, I lied. Hang on. Now, now I'm not lying. So the rest of the hybrids, knock yourselves out. You want to get it out of the way now before you get buried up to your eyeballs and work for your other courses? It's a good time to roll. Um, essentially, it has two pieces of content. They are not particularly difficult content. Um, basically, slideshow five and six is combined in one. That's for quiz three. It talks about backup and recovery strategies. In other words, how should you make sure your database is safe? It's an important topic, and it's one that's not covered in this term. Um, and by the way, if you want to actually see lectures on this again, my YouTube channel has lectures on that because I've taught this material in a different course. Um, eight, seven and eight is database careers and roles. Yay. That's career counseling. Whatever makes you happy. Knock yourselves out, do it. Um, I still need to double check, make sure that the quizzes allow, you know, two attempts, even though I'm not supposed to. Um, I'm allowing two attempts because those hybrids are kind of dumb. So, do your hybrids whenever you want. Lab six is out. It is not particularly difficult. Uh, it's not going to be due for, uh, let me go check the due date on that. Uh, lab six, November 19th. Really? Whatever. I got to go double check that date, but for now it's going to stick November 19th. If it changes, I will let you know. I'm waiting for magical emails where they keep changing the rules on Dan. How to make a prof look dumb 101 is keep changing the dates after he gives the students the dates. But for now, you guys have got two and a half weeks to do lab six. It should not take you two and a half weeks. Uh, yes. You can reverse engineer it.
Yeah. Yeah. So under database, reverse engineer, you go next. What the hell is my password? Next. Whatever one I had. Next. Execute. And finish. And in theory, uh, I grabbed the wrong. Oh, uh, no, there it is. Yeah, it's right here. Um, yeah. Yes, you are able to pull it out. Getting it to look exactly like that diagram is actually really painful. As long as you get it close, I'll be happy. <laughs>